an extra one, which means an extra one. Okay, um, here I am trying to defeat the camera location. But um, where we left off last time um, was in talking about the heart. So we'll get back to the computer here and thank you and talk about the heart. Um, <coughs> so we have um, this is an experiment done by Leon Glass, Mike Rivera, Bolera I've never met, and Alvin Shriver, who I've also never met. Um, and some other people, actually. Um, Michael Mackey was involved in this, too. So these are people in Montreal. Um, and I emailed them once uh, when it was like, you know, 75 here, and it was like, you know, minus 40 in Montreal, and it was <laughs> snowing for two weeks. So uh, what they have here are cells from chickens, uh, hearts. And they grow in culture. So this is a clump of about 100 heart cells. And they beat spontaneously. So they're all in culture. And they're beating together in unison, actually. So there's about 100 cells beating. And they stick an electrode into this clump of cells. And they can measure the voltage um, across the cells when they beat. There's a pulse of volts. And they can also stimulate the cells by putting current into the cells, too. If you're not familiar with this is the standard electrical symbol for a current source. And this is the standard symbol for a voltmeter. And this is what they say. So here they have a plot of voltage versus time coming through the cells with no external stimulation, misspelled. So uh, here, this shows that every once in a while the cells beat. So it's beat, 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 etc. So now they can also stimulate the cells. The cells beat spontaneously, but they can stimulate them. Now here, the stimulations are represented by these vertical lines, which are black for both of us. And you can see they stimulated this, they're stimulating them really fast. Because on the previous one, you can see it, you know, it's some time between the beats. And here they, they've uh, stimulated them really fast. So they stimulate the cells, and the cells are responsive. You know, you give them a good kick, and they, uh, they beat. So here they've beaten. But here you give them a good kick again, and they're refractory still. So they don't beat. But you kick them again, and now it's been long enough since they beat the first time, so they beat. But you kick them again, and they don't beat. And you kick them, and they do beat. So each of two stimulations results in one beat. OK. Now let's stimulate them a little bit slower. So you can see now the time between the stimulations is longer. And now they beat every time they're stimulated. You can see the beats are phased locked to the stimulation. So you stimulate it, and it beats, and you stimulate it, and it beats. And now they can even stimulate it slower than this. And this is beginning to get a little more interesting. Now, for each two stimulations, there are one, two, three beats. Because a stimulus results in a beat, but then you wait long enough, and it beats spontaneously, and you stimulate it, and it beats. And there's some relationship. You can see the beats are occurring even a little bit before the stimulation here. There's some relationship overall so that each of three beats is produced by two stimulations. Now, now look what, well, first of all, let me say something about this. This is an inherently nonlinear system. If we have a linear system, it always beats when you stimulate it. There may be a phase lag, but it always beats where you stimulate it. For this system, uh, the fact that we get different numbers of beats with different types of stimulation means the system is intrinsically nonlinear. This is a hallmark of a nonlinear system. Well, now let's stimulate it at a different rate. And this is the rate at which they stimulate it. So here, they stimulate at a very regular rate. Here you can see the spacing between the stimulus. But look how it's beating. I mean, if you ignore these stimuli uh, and just look at the beats, the beats look as if they're occurring in some irregular way. There is no constant number of beats to the stimulation. Here there are two, here there's one. There's no constant phase or time between the onset of the stimulation and the beat. So here it looks, even though they're stimulating it randomly, that the beat is uh, stimulating it regularly, it looks as if the beats are occurring at random. But aha, uh -huh, is this really random or is this chaos? OK, so they've done an analysis here where they've plotted the phase, that is the time with respect to the previous stimulation, uh, of one beat with respect to the previous one. And look what you see here. 
if this was really beating at random, we would fill in this whole space in the same way we did in the logistic equation. And we don't. We basically have a one-dimensional line or one-dimensional funct function that's broken in the middle. So this means that the function that determines how the cells overcome their refractoriness and are stimulatable has, is a simple function like the logistic equation. And in fact, they're able to propose a model over here, which is this line that fits the data reasonably well. And basically, the model says, let, let me draw a picture of what the model says. The model is based on, if I plot here some measure of stimulatability versus time after a beat. Right after a beat, we can't stimulate it at all, but this function decays in some way. So this means that if we wait a long time here, that we only need a little stimulus in order to get the cells to kick off. If we are here, no matter how hard we push on it, it never beats. And in some intermediate time, if we wait long enough, if we give it a big enough stimulus, see a bigger one than here, then we can get them to fire. So from looking at the curve on how the um, activation index or something depends on the time after a beat, uh, they were able to derive the curve that's given here. So that's the basis of this. So this is really interesting because these beats really look like they're occurring at random. And this is not random. There's a very simple function which is shown here that describes what's happening. And so this is really quite interesting. And it shows that this method is pulling out of the data a very interesting fact. Now since the phase space is one dimensional, just as I said, the timing between the beats is, can be characterized by a deterministic relationship with one variable. In general, the, what I've been discussing is a procedure where we start with the time series of data. We turn the time series into a geometric object, which is called embedding. We then determine the topological properties of its object, especially its dimension. And if the dimension is large, that is infinite, then the process is random. If the dimension is low, then we have deterministic chaos. So this is a summary of the procedure that I've um, been describing. Do you want me to go back to the first one of these two? And I'll have a drink and play some music and uh, If you have like a mixed screen with a little uh, window so I could like watch TV or something, you know, <laughs> during this time and keep myself occupied. You ready for the next one? Next. If you're taking notes in color, then because of some technical aspects, what I see on my computer screen is not what you see on your monitor. So actually, in this case, it's not so bad. My red is your pink, and my blue is your teal. So if you want to be accurate to what I'm seeing, you have to write um, teal. Oh, that's up there, but not there. Oh, what do you have up there? Blue. blue. Oh, and what do we have here? Blue. So it's only me. It's me and the monitor in the back. Huh. Actually, the guy who was explaining before, the change in colors has to do with the time delay between how the computer sends the signal into the video. Because the video guns project at different colors at different times, if that's out of sync, then the colors change. And it's hard to keep that, that constant time delay accurate. And that's, that's what the problem here is. For this, it's not so much of a problem. Uh, it's not really a problem at all, but for uh, apparently they said last year there was a hematology class in here and all the cells look blue <laughs> instead of red. So that was a more serious uh, problem. Okay, 
So um, now we come to an, uh, an important point, uh, which is that uh, the fractal dimension is not equal to the fractal dimension. So let me explain what I mean by this, because I think there's a confusion of this in the literature, and I might as well clear it up, at least with you people. Uh, there are two different things that we refer to as the fractal dimension, and they're not equal to each other. So the first thing is what we talked about the two previous lectures, which is the fractal dimension is when we enlarge an object, how many new pieces we find. So if we start with the time series, x versus time, and we have some object, if we enlarge it, we'll see something. The dimension tells us how many new pieces we see. So this is the dimension from last week and the week before. This has nothing to do with the dimension we're talking about today. The dimension we've been talking about today is we take the time series and we embed it, and then we look at the dimension of the attractor. And this dimension tells us the number of independent variables. This dimension has nothing to do with the dimension done directly on the time series. Okay? And it's very bad because in the literature, people referring to this dimension will usually say this is the dimension of the time series, which is very confusing. And there's not a complete understanding uh, from some people. In fact, I was at a meeting uh, to drop places I've been in in Paris a couple of years ago, which means probably eight years ago. And uh, someone had computed fractal dimensions of heart patterns by these two different methods and gotten six for both of them and said that was confirmation that the methods were the same. And I said, no, that these are intrinsically different things, do not have the same mathematical properties, and if he got the same answer, it was, was an accident. I said it nicer than that, I may but more firmly as well. Uh, and so, so these are two different dimensions. So this dimension of the time series itself is not the dimension of the attractor, and they tell us two different things. This dimension on the time series itself tells us about correlations in the time series, and this tells us about the number of independent variables. So these are two different things. So I want to try to make this clear. Uh, the basic point here is that when the dimension of the phase space set is very large, then uh, the, we think it was a chance process that uh, produced the data. And when we have a deterministic system, the phase space is low, and we think that some process here illustrated by gears uh, produced the data. And so we can, from the phase space, tell whether it was a random mechanism or a deterministic mechanism. So now let me go on to an example of um, attractors and sensitivity to initial conditions, two of the properties I said chaos has. And in order to do this, I'm going to use the Lorentz system. Um, did Ming Su Ding use the Lorentz equations in his class? Did he derive the physics of where it comes from? OK. Uh, well, I'm going to re-derive it in a, in, a, in a brief way. Well, no, the physics where it comes from is you start with a little bubble of, I'll say where it comes from, you start with a little bubble of fluid. Well, well let me start at the beginning. What, what, what Lorentz was doing is he was working on a model of the atmosphere. But the atmosphere is pretty complicated. So he's working on a very simplified model that has only certain aspects of the atmosphere. So in this model, it's hot on the bottom and cold on the top, and hot air rises, so the air rises, uh, and it's relatively thin. So what happens is that as the hot air rises, we get these convective rolls. Um, and Heinz Otto Piking claims that sometimes you, these will actually produce clouds along here. And this is the reason for seeing what are called streets of clouds when you're flying in an airplane. I don't know if that's actually true or not, but it might be. Um, so um, the way you do the equations for this, you have a little blob of, of gas. And if it's heated from below and cooled from the top, it's going to rise. And you compute the change in density as it rises compared to the, the temperature gradient. Uh, and you write down a series of equations. And then what you do is you take the, in essence, the power spectra, the periods of the different equations, and you look at the coefficients of those equations, which is called the Galerkin expansion. And that's how you derive the equations. Does that sound familiar? That doesn't sound familiar. OK. Well, in any case, we, what you do is you know that as hot air rises, it expands and its density changes. And, and from doing that, you can analyze the properties of these, this system. And it basically turns out to boil down the three equations. And let's see if this writes, yeah, it does. These are the three equations. 
so there's a first derivative and then each equation depends on the other equations. And the, the values of this number like 10 or this 28 or this 8 thirds depend on what's called the Reynolds number of the system, which in this case has to do with the height of the system and um, the velocity at which things are moving um, and the viscosity. So for different parameters of the system, these values, the 28 and the 10 and the 8 thirds would be different. So let, let me sort of give some sense of what some of these uh, variables mean. X is the uh, speed of the convective circulation. That is, it's the angular velocity. So if X is greater than zero, the rolls are turning clockwise. And if it's less than zero, they're turning counterclockwise. Let, 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 me, let me go back here to the Lorentz system in a second and sort of explain something. Um, Think about what's going on here. When you heat it from the bottom and cool it from the top, you get this motion. But look what the motion does. It brings the hot air from the bottom to mix with the cold air from the top. So it reduces the temperature gradient. And it's a temperature gradient that's driving the motion. So as it turns over, it reduces the force driving its own motion. So typically what happens, it turns over for a while and then slows down. Now, it may continue in the same direction after it slows down, but it may stop actually, and then the heat builds up again, and maybe it goes in the opposite direction. So we have, is, well, let me, um, if, is there a plot of x here? No. Uh, we had plots some time ago. This is like warp speed. OK, there it was. So, OK, uh, this is a plot of that variable x. So what happens here is that we get bigger and bigger oscillations because um, as it turns over faster and faster, it makes it less likely to turn over. And that produces these oscillations. And then in this case, it's turned over so fast that when it stops, it starts rotating in the opposite direction. So, so that's what the system is doing. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the amount of heat, or the, let me say it this way, the temper, if I, as I understand this, the temperature at the bottom is held fixed and the temperature at the top is held fixed. So we're pushing enough heat into it to keep that temperature fixed at the top and the bottom. So it's never going to stop. No, it's never going to stop, but the temperature, we control the temperature just on the outside, but it controls the temperature just on the inside. So it's never going to stop. I just wanted to give this qualitative feel for what's going on in these equations because I think it's, uh, it's useful to, um, to do that. Okay. So uh, the second variable, y, here is actually the temperature difference between the rising and falling fluid. And the last variable, z, is actually the temperature from the top to the bottom minus a linear temperature gradient. It's like somehow they didn't pay the full money for the operating system or something, so every hour and a half it crashes. So um, are, are there any questions, uh, other questions about the Lorentz system while we're... Uh, the first variable is the angular velocity, which I if you think of what I said before, since we're breaking it into a Galerian, Galeric expansion, it's actually the first term because it's the first periodic term. So, so th that first term is the angular velocity. Um, the second term is the difference in temperature between the rising and falling fluid. And the third variable is the difference between the temperature gradient and a linear temperature gradient. So we have the temperature at the top and bottom. And the first 
um, sort of basic state would be a linear temperature gradient, and that value is the difference between the temperature and a linear temperature gradient. So that's what the x, y, z are. Um, a good reference for this is the book by Schuster, S-C-H-U-S-T-E-R, which has the derivation of the Lorentz equations in them and goes into a clear description of the variables. And I have not read Lorentz's description of his equations, but overall, Lorentz's article describing this in the Journal of Atmospheric Science is, a, is an excellent article. Uh, and um, that may also have a good description of the equations. But Trista gives this more physical interpretation to x, y, and z. We have time for another question about the logistic equation. Well, uh, is there a difference between logistic mesh and logistic Oh, I meant Lorentz equation. I'm, I'm sort of been saying Lorentz all this time. So we have to go back and edit out logistic. We've been talking, all these equations are Lorentz. Sorry. But anyway, is there a difference between logistic equation and logistic mesh? No. The logistic equation, from the way I've described it, is a discrete equation, um, and it, it's a, a different word for a discrete equation is just a map. So in this case, it's, it's the same thing, right? If we had an equation like the Lorentz system, which is continuous, differential, that would not be a map. Right. Right. Yeah, I would say yes to that. Uh, we don't have the full PowerPoint implemented on this, so I can't pick a slide out of the middle. My hands are up. Let's see how close I've come. Not too bad. All right, so um, let's now do the phase space from this. Now, this is, this is a little harder to understand than the phase space because we can understand the physical description of the object. Maybe I'll even get over to here. Um, We have the real physical description, which is uh, x, y, and z. And now we're transforming that into a phase space. So within the phase space, one point here corresponds to one physical description. So as x, y, and z change in time, this point will evolve through the phase space. So we're going to replace a study of the three variables as a function of time. with the topological study of the properties of the motion of the point defined by the variables. This is probably not the world's best diagram of this, but um, the words were right, at least. This is, to me, as I said, a very hard concept because we're so used to thinking that, well, what we're going to study is the heat in this or the temperature or the motion or something. And now we've replaced that in this very deep abstract sense. And we're going to ask things about the dimensionality of this, which doesn't seem like it's directly related to these physical things. So we've really transformed the problem in a way that we're really going to stick with the phase space to do the analysis and not with this original time series of measurements. And this time I punched before I slid. So this is the phase space. And this is an actual calculation of the phase space done, of course, in basic and um, presented here. And this is also another calculation, a little finer one done. And what happens here is we start off on one of these lobes of this, 
um, object, and then we spiral out until we flip, so I guess we're going this way, to the other side. Now here, on this side, x is less than zero, so it means that the roll is going counterclockwise. Then we go counterclockwise for a while, and we switch. x is greater than zero, we're going clockwise, and then we rotate around here, and then we switch, and then we go counterclockwise. Now I want to emphasize, although it may be obvious, that the motion around these two things is not the motion of the rolls, right, of the air turning, because this is the symbolic representation. But when we're on the right-hand side, the rolls are going clockwise. And when we're on the left-hand side, they're going counterclockwise. Okay, so this is a representation. The motion around here corresponds to the changes in the physical system. The other thing I want to emphasize about this, or t say about this, there's kind of a, a sense that you might think, and this is how we think in biology, that we kind of have one state here and another state here, and we're switching in between them. You know, like sometimes we go clockwise, and then something happens, we go counterclockwise, and something happens, we go, we reverse, revert again. That's not what's going on here. Technically, there are three saddle points in these equations, here, here, and there. And the act of going around here, the act of being clockwise forces you to be counterclockwise. And the act of being counterclockwise forces you to change clockwise. This is very different in how we think about biology. We're used to thinking that, you know, um, if you're in one state, like you're happy, that then if you were depressed, something must have happened. And what this is, this is a system where the very act of being unhappy in the long run is going to make you depressed, and vice versa. So a very different, different type of thing than we're used to thinking. We're used to thinking that you're in some place and then something kicks you out. This is not like that. This is a whole unified system. So I think that's important in terms of how we use this to reinterpret biology. Yeah. Okay. Anything on this part of the curve. Remember, this is a symbolic representation of the physics, okay? So the, the motion on this attractor has nothing to do with the motion elsewhere. The, uh, the, uh, the reason why is because this is the x-axis on this. Right. I was, I was meaning more actually to do with angular velocity rather than this diagram specifically because surely the, the angles are measured. Aren't the angles measured? Um, no, the angular velocity means the, we're going in a circle. So it's, it's the rate at which the rolls are going in a circle. So when that rate, when that number is large, then they're rotating really fast. If, this, if I drink in the rest of the fluid, I could rotate this 90 degrees and show it more graphically. Shouldn't it be moving counterclockwise when it's large? No, the, the sign determines which way it's moving, right, yeah. and the value determines how rapidly. So uh, if, if I have these things, this is, you know, and they're rotating, so this is the rate of the rotation. So um, if it's probably clockwise for me, it's counterclockwise for you, so I'm not going to try to deal with that. So this would be rotating slowly, and this would be rotating fast. And, and this would be slow in the other direction and fast in the other direction. Does that answer what you were asking? No, Oh, um, oh, that I don't know. That could be the, I, I, this is a sign problem. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. It, it's not impossible in terms of what I've done here that I've gotten, um, yeah, I would say in terms of the usual coordinate system, you'd be right so that I've got a minus, consistent minus sign wrong through all of this, which wouldn't be the first time for a minus sign. Some people have trouble with factors of pi. I'm usually pretty good on factors of pi, but minus signs I miss up every once in a while. So but I think you're right, actually. But it doesn't alter anything in terms of these arg this argument. 
And this is a plot. This is actually a real plot of x um, versus time. Um, I have to think a little bit more, actually, about what you said, because it's the coefficient in front of that angular velocity term. So it may, it's maybe not as simple as it, as it seems. You're still probably right. but Because it <coughs> it's not the angular velocity itself. It's the coefficient in front of that first periodic term. So again, it depends how that coefficient is defined, although it would be probably reasonable that would be defined in the way that you're saying. In any case, these are two calculations done of x as a function of time. I did them. And they actually started off at x, y, z equals 1. And here you can see it's x is positive, it's going clockwise, and then it goes counterclockwise and clockwise. And you can see the rates increase and decrease, and it switches back and forth. Now, let me start this not at x equals 1, but at x equals 1.00001. You've got to admit, that's pretty close, right? So now, when I do the integration forward in time, uh, these are the same. But look what happens after a while. This one is x greater than 0. This one is moving clockwise. And this is less than x equals 0. It's moving counterclockwise. They're doing opposite things. Right? This is not what we're used to expecting. We're used to expecting that if you do an experiment, that you get a result. If you do it a little bit differently, you should get roughly the same result. Uh, let me see if I can get to an example of that. OK. If I go into the lab on Tuesday, and I take some cells from the incubator, and I put this blue crap into it, and it produces a certain effect in the cells, you would think that if, if I go on uh, Wednesday and I take you know, a different dish sitting there in the incubator where the other one was sitting and I put pretty much the same stuff in it, I should get the same effect. And here I'm getting a very different effect. So we have this notion, which is based on linear systems, which we've used to develop our intuition that if we make a little change into the input, that we'll get a little change in the output. And the deal here is this is not necessarily true for nonlinear systems. And this is not true for chaotic systems. And in such a chaotic system, we can make a small change in the inputs, and that can lead to a big change in the outputs. And this is really a revolutionary idea, if you think about it, because, as I said, all of the experiments that we do are based on the fact that we're never going to measure out exactly uh, 10 cc's of ART each time, that sometime it will be a little bit larger and sometimes a little bit less. But we would think that if we give it um, 10 cc's of ART w one time, that if we give it 10.00001, ART next time, we should get roughly the same effect. And what this is saying is that it doesn't happen that way for a chaotic system. That we can make a very small change in the initial conditions or the parameter and get a very large change in the output. So this is a very surprising and revolutionary result. say this in a different way. If we have a non-chaotic system, if we can compute the values forward in time, for example, the values of the variables, one value of the variable will need, lead to the next value, which will lead to the next one, et cetera. 
But in a chaotic system, as we compute forward in time because of the sensitivity to initial conditions, we in essence lose accuracy in the values that we compute. So we have now this paradoxical situation that the system is deterministic. in the short run, but it is not predictable because of the sensitivity to initial conditions in the long run. So this is very strange because we've got something where at each point we can tell what's going on, but after a while we can't tell anymore. It's just very strange. And this is what Poincaré discovered basically. Now this has let me give you another example of this, which would be fun to do live, but we're not, as opposed to dead, but we're not going to do it. Um, this is an example that Heinz Otto Piken uses in his class. It's a wonderful example. Uh, what they do is they give uh, these teachers uh, sheets of paper with x to the n plus 1 plotted to x to the n, and they use 4. And so they give them the sheet with this plotted. And they start them off at a certain point, which I think is a half or one. And then they ask them to come, so the x1 is, let's say, 0.1. It's not a half, it's either 0.1 or 0.01, 0.05. And then they do graphically, this is on graph paper, they look up on the graph paper and read off the next value. So maybe the next one is, you know, 0.3. And they take this number and put it back down here and go up again to read off the next value, which might be 0.7. Okay? So you understand, this is just a graphic iteration. You can do this by drawing a line and doing it in a different way, uh, but this is a simpler way of thinking about it, at least to me. You start with a value, go up to the curve, read off the next value, and you take that back down on the x-axis and do it again, which is what that line does when you have the diagonal. So what they do is uh, they start the teachers off and they ask people to compute x7. And then after they're done, um, people are asked to read off what values of x7 they got. And they get almost every value of x7 between 0 and 1. Everyone has a different answer. That is really weird. Like, you know, it's like you have a simple equation and you're doing the same thing. You would think everyone should come up with the same answer. And everyone has a different answer. In fact, they very widely, they're all over the place. And the reason why is every time you do this, there's a slight error. And we've just seen that because of sensitivity to initial conditions, that that means that you'll get a different result after a while. And so because of that error, everyone does the experiment and gets a completely different result. So that's nearly what this means. That's pretty dramatic. Um, it would be more dramatic if we actually did it. We don't have time to do it. But it's, um, it's a very nice exercise. Now, okay. Uh, this time I. Um, in the deterministic universe, we have these initial conditions, and we can compute all future and all past values. But in our chaotic universe, we have initial conditions, but because of the sensitivity to initial conditions, we cannot compute all the future values. So even though the system is deterministic, we can't compute everything that's going to happen in the future. It's a little strange. Say this in terms of the attractors in the phase space. If we start off away from the attractor, and this is what I said a long time ago about the transients. If we start off with a funny value, there'll be a period before we get to a more regular something. And that period is called this, or that action is called the transient. So if we start at some funny point away from the attractor, means, again, to translate this to the physical system, it means we're in a place, the physical system is in a place where it doesn't want to be. Like all of the hot fluid is near the cold spot at the top, and all the cold fluid is near the hot spot at the bottom. So it's in real bad state. It's not going to stay there. It's going to rapidly turn over. So that rapid turnover is this transient from whatever funny place we started it at to a place where it's more likely that it wants to be. So if we start away from the attractor, we're drawn toward the attractor, which is why it's called an attractor. 
But if we start on the attractor, if these were those two points that I illustrated before that are slightly separate from each other, if we start on the attractor, they stay close for a while, but then they separate from each other exponentially fast. So two points on the attractor separate exponentially fast from each other, but points off the attractor are drawn toward the attractor. And again, we're, we're replacing now the motion on the attractor language as a replacement for the physics. But the real physics is happening here. So as I said, when we're starting off the attractor, the real physics is that we've started the system in an unnatural state that it doesn't want to be in. The fact that the attractor fills up only part of the entire phase space means this system only wants to have certain combinations of x, y, and z. If it doesn't go, has those combinations, it's not happy. And, it, and things that are unhappy relax very fast to being happy, at least for attractors. So, um, okay. Now let me give you, oh, let me, let me say one other point here. So why don't you, if you can switch to the camera to me for a second, this is a hand argument. Thanks. Um, what's going on on this attractor is that we're going around, but we can only go so far because the attractor is finite. Maybe switch to the computer first and we'll switch back to the hands. Um, on the attractor here, we're, we can only go so far because the attractor is finite. That's how I can fit it on this screen. If I couldn't fit it on this screen, I'd have to give you the different glasses where you can see infinite things instead of the five-dimensional things. And then, okay. But, um, but you don't need the glasses for this. So it goes only this far, but then it, it gets folded back on itself. So the trajectories separate, but they get folded back on themselves. So now if you go to the camera, we have a situation where, um, thanks, where we go a certain distance and get folded back and go a certain distance and get folded back. So we exponentially separate and get folded back, and separate and get folded back. And this is exactly the way you make a fractal pastry, right? You take, you take the dough and you stretch it out, and then, I've uh, been watching too many cooking programs lately, but they actually make taffy this way. So we, we take something, I can't stretch this easily, I should have brought in like dough, um, and there, everything would be stuck to the table, I'd have to sprinkle out the, flour, thank you, first. Uh, so you, you stretch this out and you fold it back and you stretch it out and you fold it back. So you're creating multiple layers. The first time you do it, you have two layers. And the second time you have four layers. And eventually you have a very large number of layers. And it's fractal. The finer you look at it, the more layers you see. You can go back to the computer now. We're, we're done with the cooking. Um, so this is fractal. The finer we look at it, the more of these trajectories we see. So this isn't really a good picture of the attractor. The attractor is very fine and has finer and finer detail. And that gives us, in, um, it's really a fractal uh, attractor. Now, let me give you some formal mathematical definitions of some of these words. I've used the word strange attractor. The word strange has a very technical mathematical meaning. And, uh, no kidding. And, and the, 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 the use of the word here means specifically that the attractor has a fractal dimension that's not equal to an integer. That's the definition of strange. So the definition of a strange attractor is an attractor that has a fractal dimension that's not equal to an integer. So th these pictures, which I particularly liked for some reason, uh, this is an example of an attractor that's not strange. It's got these two circles, each of which is dimension one. And this is an attractor that's strange. So this is not strange, strange. And th so that's what the word strange means. The word um, chaotic means this. It means sensitivity to initial conditions. So if we have two systems that are started off here and they wind up to being pretty similar, then they're not chaotic. And if they wind up being very dissimilar, even though they started close together, then they're chaotic. So these are the two definitions of strange and chaotic. And all four possible combinations are possible. So you can have strange chaotic, strange not chaotic, not strange not chaotic, not strange chaotic, if I did that right. But even if I didn't, you can understand what I was saying. This is why I don't believe in that syntax stuff, because even if I said it wrong, you understood what I was saying. So not only the syntax is wrong, the meaning is wrong, and you understood what I said. 
that's why I have less confidence in what's going on with those rules. Okay. So let's, let's now get to a, another uh, problem about this attractor. So let's say we're, we're doing this integration on the attractor. Yeah, let's pay, take one of these. Let's say I'm doing the red one. Look, look, look what I just told you. I told you that as we integrate forward in time, that the errors will have some errors in the integration forward in time. And those errors will grow exponentially fast. No matter how well we do the integration, there's still some error in the integration, and those errors will grow exponentially fast. So if the errors grow exponentially fast, it means after a while the calculation is meaningless. Right? And it's what, the weather channel? Is the weather channel? Well, no, but it's worse than that. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. No, no, that's... No, no, let, let's... Uh, and it's almost uh, eight after, so I should give the local weather. So, um, uh, I said it's almost um, 18 after, so it's time for the local forecast. Right? Isn't that 18 on the 8s? I do watch the Weather Channel, um, among many other channels. <laughs> OK. Now, this is an important point. So let's, the point I'm making here is not the unpredictability but, um, of, of, of where we wind up later, but the question I'm raising, if the whole set of equations of the values x, y, z are unpredictable, how can we ever calculate an attractor? What, what I've told you is I formed this attractor by advancing these values forward in time. And now I've told you that when we advance these values forward in time, that I get meaning or unpredictable numbers. So how can I ever present to you the attractor? That's the issue I'm raising. Is that clear? Okay, because I computed this attractor, and then I told you we can't compute the attract, we can't compute the, the values. So how can we compute the attractor if we can't compute the values? Right. But if your system's bounded, isn't it going to do some limits, finite limit to the error? No, it's going to be folded back on itself. Remember, it, since the system is finite, it's going to be folded back, so we'll just be in some screwy place. So th the errors themselves cannot grow beyond the size of the attractor. That's certainly true. But it's going to be folded back, so we could be anywhere, pointing if my finger doesn't work, we could be anywhere uh, on the attractor. Okay. The point I was saying is that if we compute one of these trajectories, that since they're errors, and I've just said the errors will go exponentially fast, how can we compute the attractor if we have exponential growing errors? And the answer is a very subtle but a very important one uh, and leads to a very important point which has been difficult for me to understand, so it's not even in my new book because I figured it out kind of after that even though it's obvious, but it's, it's one that I think takes a long time to sink in. And the basic answer was the shadowing theorem. Um, the shadowing theorem basically says there's an infinite number of, of trajectories on the attractor. Now, how we handle things with infinities is different than how we handle things with numbers. And basically, if we go off the attractor by accident or due to error, because the attractor attracts the thing, we're sucked back on it real fast. But if we're on one trajectory, uh, and so, we'll be on a trajectory when we come back to the attractor. We won't be on the one we were thought we were on, but we'll be on one that's a real one, even. Now, this is illustrated in pictures, which reproduces some of the words that you didn't have time to copy down on the other uh, uh, slide. So we start someplace, and the error pushes us off. But because we're attracted back to the attractor, we wind up back on the attractor, but we're just in a different orbit than we thought we were. So the one we actually compute is not the one we're trying to compute, okay? but it's still a valid trajectory because there are an infinite number of trajectories on the attractor. This is called the shadowing theorem. Let me try to make clear the consequences of the shadowing theorem. Are there any questions about where we are so far? Yeah. Okay, if there's an infinite number of trajectories, then really you could just say anywhere in three-dimensional space is where you'll be. 
No, that's a good question, and the answer to that is no. And the reason why the answer to that is no is because uh, the attractor, thanks, the, the attractor doesn't fill up the whole three-dimensional space. And no matter where we wind up, if we get off the attractor, we're sucked back down onto the attractor. So we're not going to fill up every place in the three-dimensional space. Oh, you can have an infinite number of things in a finite space. Within, sure. Um, yeah, let, let me show you an example. This, this is a space within this square. Within this square, there are an infinite number of points. Because each point is real small. There are an infinite number of points in this square. It's really big and maybe it's too big for us to count, but that's not infinite. I mean, you can only get so Okay, let, 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 let's, 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 let's get a little more technical and say what we mean by infinity. Okay. Infinite, this symbol means, okay, if you give me a number, so you give me a number. I can pick a number greater than the number you give me. If that's the situation that prevails, then we say there are an infinite number of things. Okay. So the fact that you're saying there are a very large number of points that you can't count, if I can translate that to say that, you know, if you tell me what, how many points there are that you guess, I can say there are more than whatever you guess. Well, theoretically, that sounds nice, but realistically, you have to stop at a certain point. No. In, in, in terms of the points filling up the space, you, you never have to stop. L l let me say it in a different. Let me say it in a different way. Let's say I write the x and y coordinates of all the points. Okay. As I start to write the coordinates of the points, I can make longer and longer decimals for the coordinates of the points, in the sense that I can continue this process on forever. Okay. I have a, a number of points that's larger than it can be ever counted because I cannot enumerate all of them. That is, I can't list. If, if there was a fixed, if there was a limit to the number of points, I can list in numbers all the x, y coordinates of those points. It may be a very long list, but I could list them. And since it's not the case I can list them because I can always add this one will be different you know, from this one. You know, and I can always keep that going on. I can create an infinite number of points in here, an uncountable number of points. So why are those two points? I see that the numbers are different, but why are they necessarily two different points? Okay. That's, okay. They fall on the same point. Okay. Because, because, okay. Because a point is one dimensional. The definition of a real mathematical point, I'm sorry, sorry is zero dimensional. It doesn't take up any space at all. And because it doesn't take up any space at all, these two things therefore represent different points. The points, mathematical points, are very small. And because they're so small and don't take up any space, they're infinitely close together. And so there's an infinite number of them that would be needed to fill the plane. I get it, but I don't like it. What, 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 you don't like it because you think things should have an extension, and so there should be a size, and so they should overlap. But th these mathematical definitions of points in lines don't overlap. It doesn't work like that. They're really generalizations of real points in lines that you can draw, like this is a point that you can see. Right? If I could made this a mathematical point, you wouldn't be able to see it. Right. It's well, it's, it's real in the sense that it has dimension zero. It, that means, well, that's why it has dimension zero. It doesn't take up any space. It's, it's not there. It's not real. No, it's, it's there. It's just that it's not very big. Right? You, I can tell you exactly where it is, and it's just not very big. But it's there. And because it's not very big, there can be another one infinitely close to it. OK. All right. So 
Um, so the, the, the deal here is that um, let me now say this in the most, th this is, this will sound as if, this is the most radical way to say this, but it's not any more radical than the other way of saying it. But I think it makes it more, it makes it hit home more. We're used to thinking that if we have some plot of some function versus time that we do in an experiment, so we have some data. And let's say we have some model of that data. We really kind of like the model of the data or the theory to match the data, for example. This is kind of based on the, uh, and we also expect that if we run the, the experiment on Wednesday, that we get the same result as running the experiment on Thursday. Okay. What this is saying is that neither of these things are true. That if a system is chaotic, that the time series is not, and let me use the word invariant, meaning that each time we run the experiment, we can get different values. So the time series, say in a very technical way, ain't real. So this is not a technical way. This is, I'm trying to say this in a somewhat colloquial way. What is real then? What is real is the attractor is real. Each time we run the experiment, we'll get different values, but those different values will form the same attractor. So what's important in the experiment, or what we want to match by the theory, and this goes back to the question that was asked before, is the, is the attractor not the time series of values. L let me give some more examples of this because I think this is a hard concept. You're talking in that case about you're running your chaotic time series and the attractor is the attractor. I'm not sure what you mean. You, have you got different initial conditions with that? Or? The, co the initial conditions are always different because in the real world, we can never set things exactly equal to what they were before, ever, ever. <coughs> so let's give an example. Let's say I have voltage versus time. And over here, we have some event, s some stimulus, for example. So we have some stimulus at this point. And let's say we rerun the experiment. Since we don't know, th so let me say a possible name for Cotman's Martha. We, we rerun this experiment again, and we have this, the person here the same name, for example. We're kind of naively used to thinking that if we set up the experiment in the same way, and if everything else in the brain is constant, that this should be the same as that. That's what we're used to thinking. And what the chaos is saying is no. Okay? Now, we can run an experiment and get a different time series each time. But If we do the attractor for both cases, if we take this and embed it, we'll get the same attractor. That is, what's true about the system, what's invariant, is the attractor, not the time series. Again, I, this has tremendous implications for how we handle biological data and how we think about systems. We're really used to thinking that if we set up everything in the same way, we should get the same result. And this is not necessarily true. That we can get very different looking results, but nothing is different in the system, and we learn that by looking at the attractors. 
in the technical physics jargon, we say that there is an invariant in the system, and it is the attractor that's the invariant. In terms of physics, for example, about 150 years ago, people knew that changing electric fields produced magnetism and changing magnetic fields produced electricity. But nobody knew how they were related. It was very confusing. And in essence, what Einstein did in the special theory of relativity is to show that there was some combination. I'll represent it this way. This is actually not the right combination. There were certain combinations that were always invariant in that if you moved at constant velocity, you would change the mix of the electric and magnetic field, but the invariant always remained fixed. And this is why people believe special relativity, because people could not understand this for 50 years in the fact that special relativity suddenly made it clear how electricity and magnetism were related was the reason why people believe special relativity. Not that he had made a prediction and someone had done some experiment, but it was so beautiful that people felt it had to be true. And this is the concept of an invariant in physics. I mean, other concepts of invariance in physics are things like energy and momentum. So when we have a collision of um, Is the two ball red? What color is ball is red? It's not the black one. No, well, the black one is an eight. I got that right. See, I know something, but not. Um, I have a sneaking suspicion it is a two ball, but it doesn't matter. We know that when these uh, billiard balls or pool balls collide, um, that they go off in different directions. And from conservation of energy and momentum, we can compute what the angles are and the velocities in which they go off. Because the momentum in, in, in a, is invariant in a collision. If the collision is elastic, the energy is conserved, which is the definition of conservation of energy. So the point is that the invariant in the experiment, if the system is chaotic, The invariant is the phase space, not the time series. And, and this is a really important conclusion. So even though it's written crummy, I'm going to blow it up, enlarge it, maybe. Okay, This is a very, very important concept because we're I mean, in all of the lectures we have here, the seminars and the journal clubs, we're really used to looking for reproducibility in the experiments. And what this is saying is that the chaotic system will have something that is reproducible in each experiment, but it's the attractor. It is not the time series. Okay? So this is, this is a very different way of looking at things. and It's a very important implication for things. Now, no one has ever said it quite this way. Everyone, the words that everyone uses are equivalent to what I'm saying. So I'm not saying anything new, but I think for it to really hit home like this, you really have to understand it in this way. That's the real lesson of this, I think. And, and I don't think that is brought home as clearly uh, as, as, as this is. And I think the exercise from Heinz Otto Potkin's group in terms of having 40 people do the same uh, graphical integration and all coming up with different numbers, even though it's the same attractor, sort of really shows where 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 this really is. Did you want to ask a question? Well, it, I mean, the attractor doesn't tell you anything. No, the attractor, uh, what does the attractor tell us? OK. If the attractor exists, because it doesn't have to be an attractor, and it has a small dimension, which means it exists, then it tells us the system is deterministic. Okay, So we know it's not random. It tells us the number of equations, that is, the number of independent variables, that are needed to describe the system. Okay. 
And there are ways of looking at the attractor to actually get the equations that describe the attractor. So we can actually get the equations that describe the attractor and predict or generate the time series. Now, very often it's not possible to do number, uh, sorry, it's, it's not possible to do number three. We can do a piecewise linear approximation, which not might be useful, sort of like curve fitting um, that I don't like. But um, sometimes we can get the equations. We've seen for the logistic map that we can get the equations. For the Lorentz map, it would be complicated enough, so from seeing the attractor, we probably would not be able to get the equations. But for some cases, we can get the equations. So this is the real model that describes the system. So we can learn very useful things. We also um, sometimes, if, especially if we know the equation, we might be able to predict that there are bifurcations, that is, how the equations depend on parameters. Maybe. Um, we basically get a description of the system. We also know if it's chaotic, we know that there will be other chaotic properties present, okay? which include sensitivity to initial conditions, for example, and the other properties of chaos that I've described. So, so we learn a lot about the system. We know it's going to behave chaotically and that we have to be careful about how we do things with respect to initial conditions. We know it's deterministic, we know the number of variables, and we know formally, the equa maybe formally, the equations that describe the system. So you can really learn quite a lot about it. But not all of this necessarily going to be true. No, no, all of this will... No, no. All of this, all of these properties are necessarily true because they come from the properties of the attractor and not the time series. So these equations that describe the system will mean we can't make predictions with them, but they are the right equations that tell us the interactions that are going on in the system. For example, let's go back to the logistic equation. Robert May use this as an example to describe the number, I'll say insects, it's really actually arthropods around a lake each year. So x to the n would be the number of insects in year n, and x to the n plus 1 would be the number of insects next year, year n plus 1. If we found this, uh, this coming, this is our attractor, now what this attractor says is when there are a few insects, we go up, next year there are going to be more because this slope is greater than one. So it says if we have few now, we get more later. But if we're at this part of the curve, we are a lot now, then this is going to be lower next time. So this is less than that. So if we have many insects, there's not enough food for everybody and we get less in the next year. So from the properties of the attractor, we could learn about principles of the system. So again, we're getting these invariants out of the attractor because things that are not fixed in the time series are fixed invariant in the attractor. So we can learn from the properties of the attractor like its dimension. And we can use the knowledge of the attractor to try to get at some of the principles that are going on in the system. So that's really quite a lot. And the other thing that it saves us from, if we didn't understand this, we'd be really confused why every time we measured from that cortical cell, we got a different recording, right? If you measured from the same cortical cell for the next 15 years trying to do your PhD thesis, and you got a different recording, because you felt that if you did it right, then you'd get the same recording with each stimulus, by the 16th year, you'd be very frustrated. OK? Uh, but this is a very important point, because we're really used to thinking that we've got to get the same result from the same stimulus. Okay? And this is saying, if the system is chaotic, it doesn't have to be chaotic. If it's chaotic, we're going to get different results each time. 
okay? And what's real is we have to analyze the data in a different way. Not the time series, but something else. So it's not only that the attractor gives us good stuff, it prevents us from doing things in a way that are not meaningful. Is that convincing? You're going to think about it. Yeah, I'll think about it. Okay. Another slide before push. Okay. So um, sensitivity to initial conditions means that the conditions of an experiment can be similar, but that the results can be quite different. And this is um, um, this is what we've seen before. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about bifurcations, and then we'll go on next time to talk about whatever it is that comes after bifurcations. Um, this is this system again with different, a different value of A. So this is the logistic equation with the value of A equal to 3.22. And it goes, you can see, between two values. Now I change the value of A by 0.2, I think. Yeah, 0.2. So I change it by 0.2. And now the height here is a little bit different than it was before. See, here's a little smaller, here's a little bigger, but it's pretty similar, right? It's sort of the same stuff. Now I'm going to change uh, A by 0.2 again, just what I did before. Look what happens now. It's very different. So this is an example of a bifurcation, that we change a parameter by a small amount, and the system qualitatively changes. And again, we're not used to seeing this in linear systems. This is the hallmark of a nonlinear system. And we can make what's called the bifurcation diagram. So what we do is we start with the value of A in this equation, one value of A. We'll give some starting point. Just what I said before, we'll integrate this equation a number of times. Uh, we're going to compute x2 from x1, x3 from x2, et cetera. We're going to throw away the first couple of ones, which may mean 100, because those are the transients before we hit the attractor. And we only want to be in the state where we're stable in some sense when, when we're on the attractor. So we, it doesn't matter where we start. We'll get on the attractor very fast. So we'll throw away those values that don't count. That's over here. Those are the transients. It looks like I threw away 50. And then we're going to plot the number of values on the y-axis. So what we're going to do is a little bit different than what we've done before. We have these values now of x. So uh, for a given a along this line, I'm going to plot all the values of x we have when we're on the attractor. And I want to remove, not do this for the transients, but just the values when we're on the attractor. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a different value of a and do the same thing. Okay, and this is what it looks like for the logistic equation. Oops. I, this is the value of A, and this is what the logistic equation looks like. So here, there's only the, the regime we were in before is we had alternating two values. So we change the value of A, then we get four values and eventually an infinite number of values. If I blow up a section of this, if I blow up this middle section, you can see here there are three values of A. And in fact, in a famous paper, Ed Ott wrote, period three implies chaos. And he showed that if there's a period three embedded in this diagram, then there have to be other regimes that are chaotic. So this bifurcation diagram, the bifurcations are here. We change the value of A a little bit, and we go from a region of chaos to a region where we have a nice periodic attractor. And this is what a bifurcation means. And maybe we'll quit at this point. And the next time we'll get to um, a biological, uh, another uh, biological example. And if anyone has uh, some project they're working on that has some statistical question, um, one, two, three, four, five. No, you didn't say something. Um, if anyone is doing some statistical problem that they would like to talk me about, to me about that we could then discuss in class, 
where I might have some suggestions that might be a useful exercise so they should get in touch with me and, and I can show the advantage of using a non-parametric test to increase statistical significance or something, something like that. So um, you should get in touch with me before next time. N next time is our last uh, meeting, isn't it? Isn't that, isn't that correct? Yeah.